All right. CJ, can you hear me? All right. Yeah. And we're live. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, welcome, everyone, to the third and final uh, series of the uh, microdosing webinar. Uh, happy Friday to everyone. I hope uh, everyone's having a great start to the weekend. So super excited to have CJ here and pretty much same uh, routine as last time. So we're going to uh, run through uh, this with CJ and then towards the end, we're going to announce the final winner of the Terrashroom Mega Giveaway, as well as a signed copy of CJ's book as a door prize and also um, some super exclusive Terrashroom swag. So um, cool. Well, people are kind of coming in. Would love to hear where everyone's from. So if you just want to drop, uh, I see Emily. Uh, she is saying hello from New York. Um, by the way, show some uh, love to Emily. She's our uh, social media uh, manager. She's uh, been killing it. So appreciate that. We have Allison from Northern California. CJ, where are you calling in from? I'm in Maine. Sunny Maine today. We hit 50 degrees. It's it's a heat wave. I even wow. shaved because of it. <laughs> wow. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, yeah. Wow. We got uh, San Francisco, Clark. Good to, good to see you. Angela, Arkansas, Seattle, Jack. Pandora's Box is from Florida. Um, DC, Brownwood. Fellow Texans, Vernon, Nebraska, Wisconsin, New York, New Jersey. Wow, we got people from all over the U.S. I wonder if anyone, uh, Michigan. Wow, okay. Daytona Beach, New Jersey. Okay, all right. Well, I was going to say, yeah, people are just rolling in. This is awesome. Boston, uh, tons of people. Okay, this is awesome. Well, um, yeah, so CJ, uh, first off, Appreciate you coming on board. This has been an awesome webinar series, and I think it's a little sad that this is our last one uh, for this series, but yeah, we definitely will be doing more. So um, let's uh, dive in a bit, and yeah. uh, I'll let you uh, take the mic. Awesome. Well, if anyone, is, if this is their first time joining, my name is CJ Spotswood. I go by the name The Entheo Nurse. Uh, I'm a psychiatric nurse practitioner in Maine. I've been a psychiatric nurse for over 20 years. I've uh, been working with psychedelic medicines and doing education on them for the past five years or so. During that time, I've presented nationally and internationally on psychedelic medicine. I've uh, also been... Uh, Recently finishing up the California Institute of Integral uh, Studies uh, CPTR program, so their certification in psychedelic therapies and research in a year-long program that's been absolutely amazing. I also uh, do education with Psychedelics Today. Uh, anyone ever wants to check out any of their website, uh, their website or their podcast, I've done some work with them, done some education with them, and uh, done a couple of uh, podcasts with them. I've also worked with psychedelic.support on writing their, I believe it's a seven or eight hour psilocybin uh, education program for clinicians and therapists. I'd like to start off by also adding, uh, when I talk about the psychedelic medicines, you know, being a clinician, I, I am a clinician, I come from the world of medicine, but I don't believe that these medicines are something that needs to stay in there. I think that there's plenty of other places that people can go for personal reasons, personal research, um, the betterment of well-being, that's uh, one of the terms thrown out with Hopkins, uh, spiritual reasons, things like that. I think that just the medical uh, applications that we're looking at and, and talking about and the research being done is a great start for a lot of people and making a lot of people feel a little more comfortable. Uh, like my parents, probably anyone else's parents who are just kind of like on the fence. I, I'm glad that we're getting this research done. I've been working with psychedel uh, the uh, microdosing for the last uh, two, three years during that time, I ended up uh, writing the microdosing guidebook I've got here uh, available everywhere to talk to people how to go into doing microdosing, someone who has absolutely no idea. A lot of the information in there can be found online, but it just makes it a nice, easy package that someone can pick up that has absolutely no idea and wanted to kind of learn about it a little bit more that, you know, read about it or heard about it online because people are talking about it. 
as of right now, I probably have about one patient a week come in and asking me specifically how to go into microdosing and how to uh, do it. And most of them have no idea of my background. They're just interested in it and then pleasantly surprised when I let them know um, my background and show them my book in my office. So it's really, it's, it's neat. We're seeing this paradigm shift that's coming about with psychedelic medicines. Um, I also want to give a quick shout out to the band Annie in the Water I was hanging out with last night, a friend from my hometown who was here in Maine uh, from New York, and it was kind of a cool show. So they're out on tour now. If you're into jam band music, absolutely go check them out. Um, yeah, this week is going to be a little bit less uh, on topic. I've got my slides here to kind of go over if people have some specific questions. I have some graphics for it, but I know over the last couple of weeks when we've been doing this, there's been a lot of really great questions, and I wanted to kind of leave it more of a open format so that way people can go away from this feeling they've been, uh, their questions and concerns have been addressed a little bit and and specifically answer. Um one of the things I do want to say beforehand, before doing that, you know, this is intended for educational purposes only. The, no way is this presentation, myself, um, or any of the aforementioned persons, including Tara Shroom, encourage or condone the purchase, sale, transfer, or use of any illegal substances, nor do we encourage or condone partaking in any illegal activities related to illegal substances. This presentation is intended for uh, professional medical, not um intended for medical professional diagnosis or treatment. I am not your clinician and anything that recommendations I talk about, I encourage you to go talk to your PCP or psychiatric provider for that. Um, largely in, in that, you know, I'm not going to tell you what to do. And that was kind of the, the basis of, of writing my book. I, I put it all together and I wanted to make sure people felt uh, secure. And I had said to them, you know, bring this book to your provider that way they can have answers and kind of see where I'm coming from. Because when it comes to researching uh, microdosing specifically, there's not a lot of great research out there. A lot of it is um, figured out from what, el what else is out there um, with macro dosing and kind of then uh, boiling it down a little bit to this point where here's where I'm coming from with the microdosing world of it. Um, this is also coming from the harm reduction model where if people are going to be doing this on their own, I want someone to come in in a safe and uh, safe manner and do it in the most uh, safe way possible. I think when it comes to psychedelics in general, they are inherently safe. Um, in most cases, there's some contraindications that we know. There's some things that can go wrong, but in a proper safe set and setting, uh, things are usually pretty good, even when someone might have a bad trip or what people call it. I don't like to refer to it that. I refer to it as a good, as a uh, difficult trip, because sometimes there's some great meaning making that can come out with integration afterward. So that's where some people kind of get hung up with talking about these. They're like, how do you talk about these being illegal? It's that harm reduction. And I refer to it as risk reduction when it comes to this, because there is some inherent risks, but there isn't really a lot of inherent harm to them. So that being said, what are we looking at here for any questions, Jared? And give us a place to start, I guess. Yeah. yeah so if there's say, anything. Um, one thing, one thing I, I put this in the chat, and so I'm going to throw this out there. Uh, so just to uh, kind of really get the, the juices flowing or, in, you know, the incentives going. CJ, so whatever you deem is your favorite question from the audience, that, that person's going to get a... Uh, a, a tear from hoodie. So, awesome. um, so yeah, keep that in mind. So this is not my decision. This is CJ's decision. Oh, so um, yeah, now. Maybe, maybe it's, you know, hot dogs or hamburgers. Maybe it's, you know, what is your, uh, what is your favorite personal mushroom train that, you, uh, you know, you think for your own personal health and wellness, I would really say there, there's no limit. So, um, I'll probably, I mean, I, I think this is one thing that I'm just like really, really curious to hear about you, CJ. Cause, um, you know, I'd love to just like hear like, what was your introduction into mushrooms? Like, I think probably everyone is probably wondering that and we can kind of start yeah. there, but then definitely get more into the scientific side of things. Well, the, I mean, I had some fun when I was in college and the many, many times I went to college and back and forth and enjoyed that. Um, but I never thought of them at that time really as being anything more than, you know, uh, pleasure enhancement, you know, sitting by the water, listening to fish at my fraternity house back in Potsdam, New York, uh, and just sitting there listening to, to music and enjoying the river and hanging out and 
you know, doing things like that, not looking at the healing qualities of it. Um, mm. Fast forward a, a few years and, and we started seeing people start talking about it. And my first real introduction, I think I talked about it in the first week was when I had a patient come in who was a uh, first time psychotic break in his fifties. And it just didn't make any sense. And about two days later, when the psychosis started to lift with medications, he had admitted that he had been using the penis envy strain of, uh, psilocybin to help treat his untreated um, depression. And it just kind of blew my mind. And I started going down that rabbit hole of what is penis envy to start with? Like, what is that? And I, as soon as I searched it and saw this mushroom that looks like uh, male genitalia, I was like, I'm going to get uh, work is going to be seeing this because I'm looking in the, in the work computer. Mm. But I started looking at that. And this is right before Michael Pollan's book came out. So mm. it was kind of an unheard of, untalked about. And I knew there was a lot of research in the 50s and the 60s and going into the 70s, but no one, but not to that extent. Mm. So after I looked that up and looked up the penis envy and read a uh, paper, an article in, uh, I think it was Bazaar Magazine or Vanity Fair, one of them, by Hamilton Morris talking about the penis envy and the the Dr. Um, Pollock, who was doing research on, on, on using high-dose mushrooms. And unfortunately, he was in this uh, place where he was trying to start raise money to open up a farm, and he had been murdered, and it was uh, unquestioned, like still unanswered at this point. Um mm. But he had some great research that was printed on this, and he had made the statement of, in t within 20 years, this is going to be a mushrooms are going to be a huge thing to help treat depression, anxiety, and all these other mental health conditions. And here we are. You know, this was in like 1972, I believe that he had published or 74. Um, and now here we are, what 50 years later, and we're back to where he had initially said that. And then, of course, Michael Pollan's book came out and, you know, as that was there and I'm reading all of the research I could get, all the research that Pollock did and just going in and it was great having access to everything in college because mm. you pull any paper you wanted. And I just started researching and looking and going and just absorbing it all. And then my job got a lot easier doing that when Michael Pollan's book actually came out and everything was cited so well. Mm. So really, it's been a great journey of that, of just learning this before the uh, it became really popular so i could kind of really go deep dive instead of looking at just the more recent stuff and really go through the early research like um very naive i guess not really knowing what i'm going to find and then making my own uh distinctions based on that hmm. wow okay that uh, I, I wish I would have known that before. Uh, I don't know. That, that's uh, I, I learned something new about you today, CJ. I appreciate that. Um, okay, very cool. Well, and, and we definitely have quite a few questions uh, in the chat now. So I think things are kind of drumming up. And I'm, I'm going to repeat this again. So uh, according to CJ, his favorite question that's asked will be uh, rewarded with a Terrashroom hoodie. So that's the, the bounty uh, for today. Okay, so Alexandra is asking, what is a good place to start for a beginner? Um, besides my book, um, <laughs> I, mean, I, I, I don't want to like sound uh, condescending, but I, I think that's that was kind of the the whole idea is kind of going into this as what um, how to go about this and start and looking at like the whole thing. And I think the first thing to kind of looking at is is setting your intention. What is the intention that you're having of wanting to do this? Because if you're thinking, you know, I want to look at using um, these medicines, what is, what is, why? Are you looking to treat something? Are you trying to like explore your own inner spaces and kind of learn something more about yourself? Is it to feel more connected to other people? And then kind of go from there. Where, what do you want to do? And that also counts uh, not just with uh, psychedelic medicines, but also looking at uh, the functional medicines, I, the functional mushrooms I talked about the first week. If you're looking at like pain reduction, inflammation reduction, um, if you're looking at um, increasing your neuro health or immuniz immunities, things like that. Okay. Now that I've got an idea of where I want to start with that, 
what might be the best place to start? Because it might not, you know, it might not be psychedelic medicine. It might be just wanting to improve your brain function and, and improve your overall general health. And from there, you can look into the different mushroom strains of what might be beneficial, what might be helpful. And if you're looking at the psychedelics, then kind of looking at um, which direction do I want to go? Do I want it to go microdosing and kind of not feeling it? Um, going into that sub-perceptual amount so that way you're not um, changing your mental status at all and kind of functioning in that sense? Or are you looking at doing a deep dive and jumping in and, and then, then going from there, how do I make sure I'm going to be safe in doing that? You mm -hmm. know, and I think that's where the big piece comes to um, no matter what, is it the safety with the, the functional mushrooms I talked about the first time or the psychedelics or what is, is it, am I a good candidate for that? And what can I look into to doing that? Hmm. Okay. Alexandra, I hope that answers your question. Um, that was, and if it, that was does, if it doesn't uh, follow it up with another question. Yeah, no, we, we have a lot. So, um, this is great. So Clark, he asked, he said, this might be a deep cut, but in the first session, you mentioned stacking lion's mane with psilocybin. Could you elaborate on the details of why that's beneficial? So uh, it must have been about oh, a month ago, six weeks ago, where um, Paul Stamets had ended up getting, uh, he was granted a patent for his Stamets stack, which is where um, that comes from. And with the Stamets stack, what, it, what we're looking at is, is, putting these mushrooms together to have the best outcomes with it. Um, so the Stamets stack with it is the psilocybin with the lion's mane with niacin. And if you kind of think back to the first, in that first week where I'd mentioned with the lion's mane, and I'm pulling up my notes here to kind of help as I'm doing it. Um, you know, lion's mane is helping, helps with memory. It can help with metabolism. It helps with the, um, neuronal damage that might have been happening. It can lower your blood sugars or improve your blood sugars. It has a lot of great antioxidant effects. Um, it has some great minerals and vitamins that are there. Helps with the inflammation, but um, and it also can help with the depressive symptoms, the, um, such as helping with the nerve growth and getting rid of that inflammation, which might be a huge part of the, um, the piece of depression that's there. Um, but it helps with the, that cognitive functioning. And the idea of with the Stamet stack is, is by adding that with the psilocybin, we're going to end up, you know, the psilocybin ends up having this neuro uh, improvement. Um, everything I talked about last week where it improves the inflammation as well. So when we put these things together, you know, they work synergistically. And by synergistically, meaning sometimes one plus one equals three. So they kind of optimize their work there and getting down the inflammation in the body. And then the the third piece to it um, is the niacin, which is often added. And the niacin is really exciting because what it does is if anyone's ever taken niacin, um, it, it's in a lot of like pre-workout um, things like that. It ends up um, causing some vasodilation. So it opens up the, the blood vessels there in the brain, in the body. And in doing that, it ends up having some uncomfortable effects such as, um, itching, um, redness on the skin. Um, so it can be very uncomfortable. So it has this flushing effect. So finding a dosing of that can, can be hugely helpful. But what the idea is, is the niacin will then open up all of the, these parts of the body by this vasodilation. And then it helps to push the lion's mane and push the psilocybin across the body, throughout the body, and these other parts that it might not get into because it's going through these tiny capsule, uh, capillaries of the skin and the, and the blood vessels there. And it also helps to cause these to cross over that brain, um, the blood brain barrier that's um, inside the brain. It's there as a protective. So we're actually kind of, it helps to kind of saturate the, um, these parts of the brain to get them to cross over. So when we add these all together, it really helps to work, um, work to get this there overall. And that's kind of the idea of, of the, um, stacking them together. Hmm. Yeah. And, and I think one thing I want to add on that is I don't know where I want to say it, one of the interviews he was on and correct me if I'm wrong that if you've heard differently, but I think I've heard that on the salmon stack, whenever they would uh, study, like they basically uh, stain 
the uh, brain cells that they saw like a 23% growth in neurogenesis. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought that was, so I, I think very concisely to answer Clark's question, um, it makes your brain bigger, literally. Yeah. No, and, and connect it better. It connects yeah. everything like in a more efficient way in a, in a better way as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, and there's a lot of health benefits there with with the lion's mane on its own. So why not adding it in there to, to the rest of it? Right, right, absolutely. Um, okay, so going through the comments. All right. Um, okay, so we have... Let's see. Okay. So Wes asks, uh, to my question for my own medicine, uh, oh wait, I'm not able to look at previous, hmm, one second. Let me see if I can, I'm not sure why some of the old comments aren't loading. Um, all right, let's open this up. Okay. So some questions that we have about well, is just like popping off. Okay. So, uh, William asks, I've been told that going in to say, uh, a second day next is not as effective as first. Is that a truth or a do dosage issue too much day one, et cetera, as far as setting up a good schedule to follow? Uh, so, so that's, uh, it's on the individual uh, preference and do I have access? Like, are my slides up here so people can see them? Yes. Correct. Yes. So let me bring that up here while I'm talking about that. Um, one of the things I talked about a little bit that uh, first week or the second week was the difference of the two different stacks that are the two different um, protocols to go into. And with the two different protocols here, there's the uh, Fatiman protocol and there's the Stamets stack. And kind of the theory behind um the Fadiman protocol and, and what um, James Fadiman had said early on um, at one point was the idea behind the Fadiman protocol was not to be better necessarily than anything different, but it kind of gives the person the ability to journal, research, and look at the effects that it's having, and then a day without it and how it still has that um, honeymoon phase maybe the next day, and then the third day kind of feeling what it's not there and kind of reflect and then being able to go back in. It was basically there, uh, the Fatiman stack was there, or protocol was to be able to research it the best way. That way you have some control days in the middle of it. Um, neither of them proven to be better than the other. One of the other ideas that's out there potentially is um, when someone takes uh, psychedelics in serial succession different days, there can be a little bit of a tolerance there. We've seen that with mescaline. We've seen that with LSD. And we've seen that a little bit with psilocybin. But we don't know if that's the case necessarily with microdosing or not. Um, so the idea kind of behind it is, is kind of evaluate where you're there, what it's doing, what it's not. Um, but it might not be, you know, the best of, of needing to go every every third day or it might not be the best way to go. It, we just don't know yet. Um, mm. Nothing has seen that anything better um, being doing the serial, like uh, the Stamet stack is five days on, two days off. So during the week, work week of Monday through Friday, you dose. On the weekends, you don't. And theoretically, the idea is, is then it gets rid of that tolerance over those two days. And then when you start back over. I, I've not seen any research on it saying that uh, the tolerance is there with microdosing. Um, everything there is acetyl that people have. So we just don't know. So it, it, it's kind of the personal preference for it. If someone gets benefit from it during the week and that's great. But the other idea, you know, we need to think about is, is when we're microdosing, a lot of times people want to do something that's kind of away from the traditional Western medicine model of taking a, a, a medicine every day, like a antidepressant medication that you have to take every day. You mm. know, it gives you a little bit more of a control of it. And mm. kind of the way I walk through in, in, in uh, the microdosing guidebook a little bit is, is as you build that relationship with the medicine, as you learn to know what it does to you, what it feels like to you, what's going on in your body, you might be able to have this like feeling of, I want to do it on this day and maybe this day and, and for the betterment, but not necessarily every day. You might know 
where you're at. So some people might microdose on a Saturday as they're going out for a hike. So they're more connected with their partner they're hiking with and more connected with nature. Some people might do it like for the cognitive uh, abilities and improvements during the week. It's really to kind of find out what is your intention behind doing it and how might, how might that help you? Hmm. Okay. Um, we got a lot of comments, so uh, we, we will uh, kind of turn this into like a, a speed round, maybe a bit. Yeah. But um, uh, Anthony asks, how does microdosing help with CTE? Oh, so CTE would be the um, the uh, trauma, head traumas, head injuries. Mm -hmm. um, with that, kind of the what the research, what we're looking at is is as someone has had these these major hits to the head, all these problems that have happened, there's inflammation that's happening. Um, so as the someone is microdosing, um, it decreases the inflammation that's there. Decre like by decreasing the inflammation, it can improve um, uh, memory. It can improve um, sense of feelings and 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 the mood but it also there's uh, that dendritic growth i have talked about where the actual like parts of the brain that carry the messages like the spider web of it like like mycelium um it helps to increase that dendritic growth so there's more of a connection there and with that also the connection to other spots of the brain that might not be there but also in the rest of the neuro system I talked about like there was a guy who uh, was microdosing after having a uh, a stroke and started getting some connection in the rest of his body. Mm. So it's all these types of things that can happen and where that improvement might be is by getting rid of that inflammation, getting rid of the, that that way of thinking and and having that improvement. Because there isn't any real great um, medicines out there for CTE, mm. unfortunately. Mm. And most neuro neuro inflammatory issues as well, mm -hmm. such as Parkinson's, um, Alzheimer's, ALS. Right, right. Wow. Um, and and I think it's it's interesting you're talking about that because Caitlin um, she asked a really good question. I think this is more a bit personal, but she's asking: Are your colleagues supportive of your interests in research in psychedelics, or and or have you received a lot of pushback? In the five years I've been doing this, I've been expecting pushback left and right, and I have not had like any. And I mean that in the in the greatest way because um, the way I have approached this is here is from the um, best best research that's out there. The I'm coming from this. Um, I don't talk about most of it like this is my experience in doing it. It's here's the research that's out there and what people have kind of told me. Mm -hmm. And with that, people are um, comfortable with it. Um, and most people are actually have, have the feedback I get is very supportive as in, I'm glad you're doing this because I don't think I could. Um, most people wouldn't be doing this. And that's where I feel, you know. It, it's the it's normalizing these conversations. Mm -hmm. I mean, my first time I went to a, a conference to talk about it, I, I remember talking to my wife the night before and just going, I have no idea. I, this might even be career suicide. And then like after I went and it was 500 people and I'm talking in front of a bunch of psychiatric nurses and um, substance use disorder nurses. And they were just like, oh my God, I'm glad that this research is out there. And their bigger questions is where can I find this research and where can I go about it? And I'm glad someone's talking about it. I didn't have any negative from it. Mm. Um, and when I've talked about with colleagues at work and stuff, they've all genuinely just like, oh my God, I'm glad you're a resource for this. And can I have my patients come over and just do a one-time consult and talk to them about this? Because I don't know how to, like, I, this is not my wheelhouse. And obviously you you have that comfort level and, and you have the knowledge. Can you do it? So it's been the exact opposite of what I've always expected. And I keep having like these surprises that people are, are, are accepting. And the, the biggest part of like where the normalization that is weird was weird to me at the first couple of times is I had a friend reach out who one of her students, she's a high school teacher. And one of her students in her thesis, senior thesis project was doing a, a big presentation on microdosing and wanted to know if she could talk to me and interview me for this talk. And I'm going, I'm surprised. I'm like, people are wanting me to even do this and talk about it, let alone going in and talking to high school students about this. Like when I was in high school, it would have been 
that this is your brain on drugs with a frying pan, and that was it. Not mm -hmm. that there's something else out there, something's different. So right. we're seeing this normalization, and, it, and it's just awesome to see. Wow. Yeah. So, and, and I think um, a little bit getting away from like the medical, um, maybe more into the like biological. Nicole asked a question. She says, do you know if anyone has studied, explored, or written about how psilocybin allows us to open to deeper connection, understanding, or communication with plants, trees, forests, and even house plants? Yes, there is. I can't pull up the sources off the top of my head, um, but there is some there's some research where it's shown people who have used um, psychedelics have a more of a connection with nature and. Uh, with that, I talk a little bit in, in my book about like that, the Japanese idea of uh, um, forest bathing and being out there with nature and Albert Hoffman, who was the chemist that first uh, discovered LSD and then later discovered the psilocybin uh, inside of the psilocybe, talks about the best time to micro to, to dose um, is to do it in nature. And that's where I, I, I feel... Um, I'd like to see more things getting set up outside of the medical model of this. So that way people are having these retreats and doing this and outside. Some of my best experiences have been like outside in nature hiking and just feeling that connection with the, uh, the duck that was in the water I'm watching and the, the deer that are watching me just kind of like, it's just like, and it might be the medicine. It might be something else, but the, that connection of just like making eye contact and like, I wasn't scared of them. They weren't scared of me and just watching me with this, in inquisitive sense to it um there's been some also some good research out there looking at the um five personality traits and how those have changed with uh psychedelics and that's kind of the piece where i'd like to see the research being done of like what are these changes that are happening how can we do this especially when we want to add this with uh, individual therapy or group therapy and and that connection with other people hmm. all right yeah so I it sounds like, um, and I think that's what we'll do then is we'll uh, follow up uh, with any like links uh, to any findings or uh, with what CJ uh, knows to answer Nicole's question specifically. Because I think, I mean, I think everyone would be really interested to see uh, that kind of research. So absolutely. Um, all right. So Lance asked a really, I feel like this has definitely uh, been something that's on people's mind. So Lance asked CJ, have you experimented with Amanita or Panther caps? I have not done any, um, anything with Panther caps. Um, Amanita a little bit, um, with it, uh, you have to kind of do like a double boil cause you have to get rid of the, Oh, I can't think of the neurotoxin piece that's there off the top of my head. Um, but it gets rid, you have to kind of get rid of that cause that's the part that's going to make you sick. Um, with it, um, doing it at night, um, helping with uh, sleep, s improvements in sleep, um, improvements in dreaming, and kind of that uh, letting go at night a little bit, um, having a little bit of that uh, anxiolytic effect, uh, decreasing anxiety, and just kind of that well-being. And did the double boil, made it into a tea, like a, with uh, you know ginger, a little bit of mint, um, chamomile tea there with it and a little bit of honey and just kind of like eased into sleep a little bit better and felt more rested in the morning and more uh more connected there and just feeling overall better um so yeah it's it's i've only done a little bit but if someone's going to go into doing that uh i rec highly recommend doing your research on it because you do have to kind of do a double boil to kind of get the good part out and get rid of the bad part which um I can't think of the name off the top of my head. I'm sorry. No worries. Um, all right. So we have some, yeah, these are some like pretty like deep scientific questions. I like this. So Michael um, asked, do you have experience with Syrian rue and specifically using it to prolong the effect of psilocybin as a MAOI inhibitor? Oh, I have not done it a lot with that. Um, theoretically, it does kind of block it. I, it. The problem is we start adding in these other things and it's just, it's not as well known. Um, and I don't know the exact um, effect of the Syrian rue on the MAOI. Um, 
I don't see where it can be overly harmful for per se, but uh, if someone is going to be, um, you know, concurrently on regular medications like SSRIs and you start adding in the MAOI and it blocks the breaking down of the, um, the serotonin, it could lead to a serotonin syndrome. I don't know if that's the case necessarily. Um, when it comes to how that is the uh, mechanism of action with uh, Syrian Rus specifically. Hmm. That's, that's really, I'm, I was going to say, I'm actually doing some Google searches now and I'm like, oh, this is, this is really fascinating. Um, I'm definitely going to, but I'm definitely going to put that on my uh, own yeah, research I, to look out. Uh, Michael, like uh, send us a DM. We'd love to, we'd love to chat more about this. Your questions are very thought provoking. Um. Yeah, so to keep things going, let's see, Alexandra asked, so she says she lives in Portland, Oregon, where the use of psychedelics became legal. Do you foresee this became, becoming or being a trend in the U.S.? Uh, short answer is absolutely. Um, I'm, we're, I mean, we're already seeing it. In mm -hmm. the five years I've been doing this, I would have never expected to be contacted with uh, high school students doing it. I would have never expected all of these um, different municipalities looking at getting into this decriminalization efforts. I would have never expected, like uh, Oregon has in, um, in Colorado, with bringing about these ways um, circumventing the FDA approval of the medicines and just saying, we want this. We don't care what you're kind of saying. Like we're going to set up this within the state and, and, and do this and being done by ballot initiative where the people are saying that they want it. Um, so I would have never expected it to be that, like that we were even challenging it like this. And I, at one point I'm trying to keep up like on research every week and the different States that are doing legislation, but it's, it's impossible. Um, I'm doing some work. Um, I've worked on some work with uh, New York Psilocybin Action Committee, and they're changing because I think that that would be a pinnacle state that if we start seeing it, you know, we'll see other states changing with it. I know when I testified here in Maine with our legislature, um, it was about exactly a year ago. They were interested, but they were kind of like, we're going to wait till the FDA goes. And it seemed very radical. But then since then, there's 12, 15 states that are coming up their own legislation um, changes. And then the, the interesting thing of, of that also is, you know, it's a bipartisan effort. You know, we have, you know, the the Democrats that are going in and wanting to have this as an improvement. Then you have the, the conservative Republicans that are, you know, wanting to go in to have this for PTSD and treatment for veterans and, and all of that it, because the conventional medicines that are out there are not, um, not as, as, useful to some people as they, we would once hope. And the cost of treatment is unreal. I do know that um, I've got a colleague, Josiah, out in uh, Oregon, who is a psychiatric nurse practitioner student working on his, uh, with a VA out there. And they're working on doing psilocybin treatment within the VA system, which is huge. We started getting the federal, starting to allow this uh, to be researched and stuff, uh, and stuff like just kind of stepping back and doing it. So yeah, it's, it's changing and, and it's because we're normalizing and people are having these questions and wanting to see something different instead of, um, just kind of sitting back, you know, every time that 60 minutes does a piece on, on psilocybin, I get, you know, my inbox is inundated with it, but then we have people who my, like my parents, probably anyone else's parents who are seeing that going, what the hell's going on here? Why is this kind of coming about when they are only knowing that these were party drugs that they grew up with and children of the sixties and they might feel comfortable with it, but like, why is this coming about it about again? So yeah, it's, it's coming and we're going to see these changes. And, and that's where I, I think the biggest challenge we're going to see is the bottlenecking of it because there's not enough providers out there um, ready to go. And, then once even then it's not going to meet the needs of it even mm -hmm. with mdma we just uh, we don't have enough that's doing it and that's planning to be fda approved by hopefully the end of the year wow. with the research so yeah it's it's coming it's just uh we'll see and i think that you know even with it being legalized there we're seeing the movements of people with the decrim doing this on their own and and trying to go in and and do it in their own way without having the medicalized model there and there's people that are going to shy away from the medical model not wanting to go into it some people are more comfortable with it and it's to each their own but it it, it is coming and 
you know, if people can grow their own medicine and have access to it, then they don't need to be waiting for these other ways and these other avenues, because when it does come out and it's legal, it's going to be costly. And we don't know what the insurance is going to look like with covering it. So there's always going to be an underground. There's always going to be a, a way of um, accessing it. That's our um, maybe clandestine methods, but it, it is coming and, and the change we're seeing it. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. That's uh, it's a great answer. Yeah, I'm uh, CJ. You're just spitting. You're like a fire hose. We're drinking from a fire hydrant right now. So this is this is great. Um, yeah. So a couple of the comments, uh, and I think what we're we're seeing a cutoff in the comments. It's it's kind of weird because it's showing a limited view. So Alex, apologize for missing this earlier, but you bumped it back up. So um, this is a really good question. What are some mushrooms that you've seen uh, seen improve memory and focus? What makes these uh, these varieties cognitive enhancing? Oh, so going back here, some of the great ones to to talk about were the ones I talked about in that first uh, week: the lion's mane, the um, the cordyceps, the the do 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 turkey. Um, yeah. So a lot of these ones I talked about in that first week, and if anyone wanted to go back into the vis uh, visit that, I know it's on the um, wherever you're checking this out uh, through the different um, social media. But uh, the big one for helping with memory is that lion's mane. Another great one that's out there for it is going to be um, the turkey tail is good. Um, reishi. Because I think that, you know, when we start looking at the cognitive effects, like that that's such a catch-all term. It's a bucket of so many things. Like if someone's mood is is depressed, you know, cognitively, they're not running at full at full uh, full volume. It's kind of like driving a car with a spark plug out. Um, if someone's chronically tired, they're not working at the best um, cognitive level they might be able to be. If they're um, I mean, on a compromised or physical conditions of whatever sense. So really, I think it's the individualized, like what is what is going on? That's the cognitive piece of it. Is it just um, cognitive slowing as we see with aging, which would be the psilocybin and, and the lion's mane? Would it be the other pieces to it? And what can you kind of go with them together? Hmm. Yeah, and, and I think it's fair to say that a lot of uh, questions like this are covered in CJ's book as well. Um, but I think to piggyback off of what you're saying, or I guess to parlay it into uh, the next question, Allison asked, are there, ther uh, are there specific strains to look to microdose for anxiety? I've uh, only ever used psilocybin once in a therapeutic setting to help my anxiety, and it nearly disappeared for years, but it's starting to come back um, a bit now. So... The short, the short answer is, is uh, I don't know because there's not a lot of great research on it out there yet. That's that's mm -hmm. part of the challenge. Um, if if someone wanted to look at um, Adam Strauss, the comedian, um, he does a great uh, stand-up comic piece called The Mushroom Cure, and he talks about for his OCD anxiety and doing macrodose. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd love to see as we get the research coming out, like what strains are better for one versus the other. And I know if you go to any of these websites that sell different um, spore syringes, they'll say this one's better for this, this one's better. But I don't know where they're basing that on. It might be just basic you know, seedal evidence of what people have said. Um, but because really the, the, the general stance right now when it comes to the psilocybin, psilocybin mushrooms is a cube is a cube. Um, unless it's a penis envy because you into the penis envy and the, the couple of the, the strains that are um, hybrids of that, they're just so much more potent. They're just, uh, you know, two and a half grams of that is, is definitely not two and a half grams of a regular psilocybe. Um, and that's why I'm hoping to see some research. And I, I mentioned in my book, there was a piece and I can't remember what it was. Um, cause part of what we look at is with the different chemicals that are in here and the different strains are this entourage effect where there's different chemicals there other than the psilocybin that we're looking at and the effects of that. Um, and there was a, um, one study that was done and it was the only study I could ever find in looking at the different pieces where they had given, um, specifically, I think it was 
Aristatin versus the biostatin. Um, can't quote me on it, but it's in the book. Um, and with that, the, the mice that received one versus the other uh, exhibited less marble-bearing tendencies. And with that marble-bearing tendencies, um, in clinical work, that is thought to be um, when mice are bury, marry, uh, burying marbles, it's because of anxiety. And with that one um, chemical that was in it, they did less of that. So I'm hoping that when we start seeing this being done more, as we start seeing more research being done of actual like places that are doing it, we can start extrapolating that data and seeing what the differences are. Mm -hmm. I mean, once we start seeing this opening up to, you know, if one clinic or one group that's doing a retreat has this the strain that they're always doing and they start having these results, but this clinic has, they always use this strain. We've seen these results and we just kind of see that across the board and we can start taking this, um, macro data and then go, oh, well, we're seeing these improvements in anxiety from this group. Maybe we're onto something. Let's research that. But there, we're not at that point and there's no money in that yet, unfortunately. And because it's so underground and not talked about, it's not. So my like my recommendation at this point is, is a, a, a cube is a cube as long as it's not a, the penis end because they're going to be more uh, stronger. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, there's uh, I was going to say there's uh, some really interesting findings. Uh, I think if you Google Oakland Cup, um, you can literally see like it's uh, basically for different strains. Like what, what is the psilocybin? Uh, basically just like the, the chemical uh, content. And it's really, really interesting to see some of the strains that people come up with, the, the hybrids, and then ultimately just like things are getting pretty potent nowadays. So yeah, watch out. I mean, uh, it's the same thing we see with the cannabis. I mean, it's the right, same right. idea too. Yeah, you know, exactly. back, you know, our parents were younger or even when, you know, we were in high school, someone bought cannabis, they bought cannabis. It was whatever that the person had, whatever they grew. And now you're able to go into a, a dispensary in many, many places and go, I want this strain for this purpose and kind of, and you have to kind of experiment of what it is and what, what are your effects with it and, and yeah. what do you like and what you don't like. But, and also keep in mind, everyone's different. So what someone says, you know, this is what was with me, it might not be with you. And that might be where the experiment experimentation comes and finding out what the best dose and what the best is. Yeah. Cause it's not a one size fits all like um, most of what Western medicine looks like. Yeah. It's that, it's that relationship with the medicine itself. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. So let's see quite a bit other, some other questions we should probably, okay. So Becca asked when microdosing for anxiety, is there a risk of increasing anxiety at first? And if so, how do you adjust the protocol? Uh, so I discussed that, um, in the book a little bit. And, and I'll, what I'll explain is, is as we start looking at uh, microdosing, the more there's some activation there um, with, with the psilocybin and even with LSD, you, they have some um, um, stimulating type qualities to them, which is why many times you know, someone might take a, even a macro dose later in the day, they're not able to sleep later that night because that stimulating effect that happens. Um, and when we look at with microdosing specifically, the side effects have a direct curve of the more, the higher the dose, the more side effects you might have. And that's where coming from a low dose, um, figuring out if it works, if it doesn't, and if it doesn't, the next time you, you dose, you can bump it up a little bit and get a little bit better. And just seeing where it's at. Um, and it might be from that activation piece to it. It might be the anxiety that's coming from that activation. It might be something else that's in, in, entirely different with it. Um, mm -hmm. But starting low and going slow with it and figuring out um, and having some consistency. I, I talk about that a little bit too, because some of the other side effects that people might have is nausea, um, headache, things like that. Um, but if you end up adding like ginger and mint to it, which are both... Um, uh, naturally anti, um, anti, uh, nausea effects to it. And you add that to it, or maybe even doing like a PF or not PF tech, like a lemon tech to it to kind of help break it down before it goes into the stomach. Um, that might get rid of some of those side effects as well. Mm -hmm. Um, because the psilocybin, it acts on the serotonin, um, the serotonin system and the serotonin, you know, we know it's in the brain, but 90% of it is within the gut and the, in the stomach and, and going down. That's why some of the side effects are there. So by getting rid of some of those, you might have it, but, uh, 
yeah, I think that if someone wants to go in and doing microdosing and for like looking at anxiety can have some amazing effects. But if someone walks in, you know, who's um, 110 pounds and starts at a dose that I might take, which would be at the higher end of 0.4, given, you know, my 250 pound size, it's going to be drastically different. So starting low and going slow just because of your body mass is going to be different. But if you jumped in right feet first, like you were with a high dose, like mine, you might be very anxious because of that stimulating effect. And that's, mm-hmm. you know, and you might be turned off by it completely because it activated and it was too much. So really going and starting out and seeing how it's affecting you. Hmm. So um, I thought what you said also was really interesting. 90% of our serotonin receptors are in our gut. That's yeah. Yeah. If you talk to someone who's on any um, SSRI, SNRI um, antidepressant medications, they might have GI upset from it when they first start taking it or a dosage increase. And that's kind of one of the the topics I I mentioned to patients. Like you might feel this for a couple of days as you're doing it. Um, You know, maybe we can just start a little bit lower and like split the pill and go up. And I I always tell people if, you know, this, this is the side effect, you know, adjust it and we can talk about that or whatever. Um, but it can be a little slow. And sometimes I even start some people who are completely med naive at like very, very tiny doses of like sertraline and things like that. Just knowing that if they started a little bit higher, they might have those effects and then not like this sucks. I'm not going to take it. Mm. So, yeah. So, um, I think, and I was going to say, so we are getting kind of near to the, the end point. So, uh, there's a couple more questions uh, that some have asked. So Wes asked, we'll, we'll combine them into. So Wes says, it seems to help bipolar folks. What are your thoughts? And he also asked, um, and do you think it helps with alcohol abuse? Potentially, and yes, for the two. Um, I'll, I'll mention first the alcohol piece. Um, when I think of any substance use disorder, I my approach really is... Um, that biopsychosocial model to it. And I always look at it as a um, looking at the whole person. And if someone does have um, whatever the substance use that they're using, what are they medicating? What are they trying to, to treat with that? And there's been some great research specifically with LSD of treating um, uh, alcohol use disorder with LSD. It was, it was planned to be a part of the 12 step program at one point by um, Bill Watson. And yeah, it can be hugely effective, especially if someone is drinking because of depression and anxiety, and it can kind of get rid of some of that. Um, the piece with the bipolar, um, it's the that's the kind of the area I'm most excited to seeing really um, as a clinician and, and as a uh, um, a person working in this field, because when we look at antidepressant medications, uh, someone that has bipolar depression, like their depression is more often depressed than, than not, um, a lot of times they can't tolerate the standard treatments of SSRI medications the um, or SNRI medications because they activate them too much and, and kind of like jack them up and they're more anxious and get more manic or whatever. Um, and I'd say I do have some patients I do have on antidepressants, but we've started slow and kind of going in that sense. Um, but it's very hard to, to treat in that sense. And there's a huge uh, number of, of suicide stuff because they just can't have any treatment. Um, well, because these medicines work differently, as in um, they don't uh, they don't increase the free flowing serotonin that's inside like the the pieces of the brain that's connected. Um, the chances are it's not going to do that, um, or the chances are, are less so. So like my recommendation I, that I I'd mentioned in the book is if someone's going to do this with a bipolar uh, history to them, you know, maybe it's worth having a buddy with you to kind of help follow your mood as well, because sometimes we're not the best barometer of how our mood is if it's getting destabilized and changing. Um, so having someone else that's kind of there to kind of be aware of and seeing these signs and kind of go, you know, your mood's kind of going off a little bit. Let's do something about that. Mm -hmm. Let's look at it a little bit differently. I think that we can see some good improvement with it. It's just going to be, I think it's uh, taken with caution, I guess. Um, So you don't kick into a manic episode or a hypomanic episode or become more irritable or activated like the SSRI medications can. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, and, that's think... for, and that's for microdosing. I want to add with yeah. macro dosing, you know, there is a higher chance for some people if there's a um, longer term psychosis that can happen with a bipolar piece to it. Um, as of right now, we see a lot of 
um, studies being done with macrodosing of, of psilocybin with um, where exclusion criteria are someone with a bipolar or bipolar history or a first uh, generation relative that have it. Um, but we're starting to see that lift a little bit as well now as we start seeing it, because if we ended up including them at this point and something goes wrong, it could ruin all of the progress that's being made. So there's a lot of caution being done at that point. So yeah. really, I think that we're seeing that change a little bit. And there's some, been some specific studies that are um, recruiting people with bipolar looking at uh, macrodosing for these effects because it can be so life-changingly improve, uh, for improvements. Yeah. Yeah, I, I was going to say, I think we, well, not us all, but I think many people we probably might have known or uh, encountered with have been a lot of mental uh, we'll say personality disorders seem that they've improved personally. I've noticed that, um, but who knows? Um, okay. So we have, let's see, two final questions. Um, one is from Bailey. This one, I think, um, I think this is kind of on the opposite end of the spectrum of what you're just talking about. Would you rec recommend micro macrodosing? for rigid mentality in people with neurodivergent conditions such as autism or OCD. Yeah, I, I think so. And I think that that's the, that's the piece that that's going to be the improvement there is, is changing the way that someone's thinking and, and uh, getting rid of that narrow, narrow mindedness that um, I talked about last week, the, uh, the canalization that happens with our thoughts and not being able to think outside of the box. And that happens even with depression, you can't think of anything different than what you know. Mm -hmm. And by having that, it changes the way that we see changing the connection around us, our connection with other people. And with that, um, we'll see it. So yeah, I think that's a huge part for it. Hmm. And there's a great um, book out there. Um, Aaron Orosky, I believe is his last name. Um, he is neurodivergent and has he wrote, uh, his book is Autism on an Acid. And he talks about his use of LSD to help with his um, autism and feeling more connection with other people, which is wow. a huge barrier with it. Great, great, great work. Wow. Okay. Um, and I think this is going to be the last one. So this is again from Becca and she says, thanks for answering my question. Uh, this one's for the hoodie favorite mushroom strain plus fish song pairing. And am I, am I pronouncing that right? P H I S H song. Fish. Pairing? Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I have to say, um, Oh, Something like a long, drawn-out live uh, version. I mean, I will say I went and uh, when I saw Fish this summer, um, I liked uh, – what did they did a 25-minute um, jam, and it was unreal. And I, I didn't know um, – it was a down with the disease that they did. It went into 30 minutes and with it, my sense of time was not exactly all there. It was kind of off. And I'm like looking at my watch going, is this really happening right now? Are they really playing this for 30 minutes? So yeah, it's, uh, wow. it was, it was neat. It was, uh, I didn't think it was real. It was amazing. Wow. wow. Yeah. I, I feel very foolish. Fish apparently is a band. If anyone's wondering um, if you might be a millennial or a bit younger, like myself, um, yeah. that's uh, <laughs> probably something to clear. Yeah. Um, or, or if you just live under a rock too. Um, and then, but she also did ask a uh, favorite mushroom strain. I really liked that golden halo I had mentioned because it's uh, easy from what I'm told not to uh, it's easy to grow. Um, and easy to, to have um, some of those, some of them can be a little bit more difficult and more finicky and it has some really good effects to it. And it's a really pretty under the microscope because it has like this golden color to the spores if you look at it, which is kind of different. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, lots of, uh, lots of different varieties you can grow that I think the visual yeah. uh, like appearances, uh, I think it's, it's interesting because people like to talk about how it makes them feel or like the potency, but it's also just like, yeah, I think it's important to, you know, grow stuff that you like to look at. So. Um, oh, just fun to watch. I mean, you, you, you sit there and you walk out of the room an hour later and there's all of a sudden caps are popping and you're just going, Oh my God, this is amazing. And like the time-lapse pieces to it, it's, it's just gorgeous. It's live yeah. nature. 
It is. Just it like is. Fan yeah. uh, Fantastic Fungi, you see that. It's just like, wow. Yeah, it's... Uh... Maybe I'm biased, but I think growing mushrooms is, uh, it's, it's, it's pretty cool. It's one of the cooler things, uh, to do. And, uh, so anyways, yeah. Um, but, uh, okay. Yeah. So we are up on time. Um, a couple of things I actually do want to say, because I've, I've noticed some people have like put some really interesting, um, comments, like maybe around like personal stories and such quite frankly. So we're looking at potentially doing some content around, you know, ways that mushrooms might have helped change your life in some way, whether um, through like mental conditions, what, whatever it is, um, we would really, really love to hear these stories. So if you either want to DM us or send me an email, jared at Um we're looking at making some content pieces. And like, th this is the stuff that, I mean, it just gets us hyped. And it's also like really good because obviously there's a lot of research that's coming out, but at the end of the day, people really connect with stories. And um, the more stories that we can just have of like how mushrooms have helped people change people's lives, like we want to hear more about that. So um, feel free to, uh, you know, send over that kind of information. Um, we really would love to hear that. Um, CJ, let's get and to if the you come, And if you come and if you come out of that psychedelic closet, I mean, it just normalizes the conversation and you don't even yeah. have to admit it. It's that you're doing it. Just like even normalizing those conversations is, is huge. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that's just the whole thing is, you know, as, as you mentioned, CJ, it's, it's always been a kind of, yeah, it's like your, your brain on drugs uh, or like egg in a frying pan or, you know, just these, a lot of old wives tales. And it's funny because I think the more you do ask people like, oh, it's like, do you know the person that that happened to? And it's always, you know, a friend of a friend or someone like a third, fourth degree connection. So I think this is very much something that, you know, we're obviously super passionate about. And I mean, it's, I, we deeply believe it's a force for good um, when you just look at all things considered the the science of it, the healing properties. So um, yeah, good things should be shared and spread. Um, that being said though, uh, speaking of good things, uh, CJ, we got to talk about some good questions and, uh, and what we'll, we'll probably do this because we're kind of having an issue on this like comment scroll thing right now. Uh, so I can't go all the way back. So basically CJ, um, tell us what is the, the, the question that oh. you, enjoyed the most and if the person is live and they're here pop your name in we'll connect if not i'll have to scroll through the comments and find out after the webinar who asked it so no pressure cj but well it's tough because there were so many great questions i really appreciate like the amount that people were really asking um and i kind of i took some notes here as i was going and and then things got moved up and you know, the, I loved the bipolar question. I, I loved the, the question with the uh, connection in nature. But I really, the question of the fish was just, it, it hit me in the, <laughs> the feels and, you know. And I, yeah. I think, I think uh, it was, if it was Becca, I think that she knew that was the case. And it was, uh, it worked out for you in your favor because yeah. it would have been the bipolar every day, every day. Because mm -hmm. I love that as, as part of it. Yeah. Well, Becca Shapiro. Congrats on your your hoodie. Um, shoot us a, a a DM or uh, we'll we'll connect with you um, afterwards. But yeah, well well thought out on the strategy side for the comment or the question. Very, like a sniper. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, no, that's that's awesome. And um, yeah, appreciate the engagement from everyone. Um, so that being said, though, yeah. So a couple of takeaways. Obviously, we you know we'd love to hear um, any personal stories. Um, we're Best question, congratulations, Becca, uh, you're getting a hoodie. Um, but we also talked about basically giving away a um, <clears throat> a t-shirt as well as a, um, a signed copy of CJ's book. So I will re-link that right now in the comments section so everyone can see that for CJ's book. So, um, and yeah, what we'll do really quickly is, and basically this is the one thing as we said, you know, we want to make sure people are live at the end of the call. So um, this is our, our way to do it. Basically just throw in one comment of your name. I'm going to close my eyes, pick someone out from the crowd. Um, that's going to basically be the winner of a t-shirt. We're going to do it again. That's going to be for a signed copy of CJ's book. So um, it's just kind of the honor system, making sure that, you know, uh, people are still live on the call towards the end when we're doing the door prizes. Um and then right after we do this, we're going to spin the wheel and we're going to announce the final winner of the Terra Shroom Mega giveaway. So that you, uh, what we're giving away is 
a tertium grow chamber, um, some swag, uh, three months of growth supplies, and uh, I'm trying to think, yeah, I think that's it. And we will be doing a new giveaway because of giveaway rules. Um, we basically have to close out this giveaway and we can't do like a rolling thing where we can just do it. So we're, you know, trying to, trying to stay legal. So that being said, okay, yeah. So if you're still on this, um, put your name down. Uh, we'll give about 60-ish seconds. Um, and uh, what we'll do is uh, a winner really quickly. So just to uh, do this. As we're waiting. So, still live on the call. If you're, uh, if you're on the webinar call, uh, yeah, push, drop your name and we'll get this going. So, all right, Adam, Kim, Haley, Anthony, Brian. Right now, about half the people have put their names. They have a, about a 50% chance of winning. So, this is looking pretty good for y'all. Allison, all right. <laughs> All right. So we're going to wrap this up in about 10 seconds. All right. 10, 9. That was a good ending point. OK. All right. So we're going to pick this real quick. All right. You guys have a really good chance of winning. So uh, all right. I'm gonna close my eyes real quick and da, 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 da. The, and to be fair this is going to be for the uh do we want to do a signed copy or the t-shirt uh which one should we give away first cj oh let's go t-shirt first t-shirt okay all yeah, right let's go t-shirt first okay all right all right okay three two one closing my eyes and picking someone we have anthony La Covara, congratulations on your Terrace Room t-shirt. Um, if you can send us uh, an email, here I'll put my email in the chat. And uh, send us an email, we'll be able to uh, hook you up. And I guess like shipping address as well as uh, preferred t-shirt size. Okay. Um, now this is going to be for the signed copy of CJ's book, the Microdosing Guidebook. Um, Pretty much like it's incredible we've read a pre-copy of it and it's like amazing stuff all right we're gonna do this in three two one and we have allison russell congratulations on the book uh if you can also uh send send us an email of uh, shipping address we'll get that out to you Okay, and then so last but not least, um, we are going to get the uh, Wheel of Fortune going live. So I'm going to add this spinning. This is for the Mega Terra Shroom giveaway. And the winner is, congratulations, Russell. Okay, I'm not sure if you're on the call or not. If you are, congratulations. If not, um, we will send you an email. We are not giving out your personal information, obviously, on this call. So, um, but yeah, congrats on that. That's super exciting. Um, so, anyways, yeah, we will be doing a uh, a Q and A next week. Um, so, basically, this is going to be the team behind Terra Shroom. So, we're going to be doing company update, um, product demo, basically, just all the information uh, that you guys have probably been wondering. We'll be sending out a customer email update as well. We will be posting um, this uh, episode for the microdosing uh, webinar series. And uh, that being said, I mean, this is this has been incredible. Uh, CJ, any closing thoughts or remarks before we wrap this up? Uh, follow me on the social media there. Uh, everything is under Entheo Nurse. If you did not win, my book is available anywhere that you can get books. Um, you can get it on Amazon. Please leave a, leave a review on there if you do get it. Um, but, uh, also 
it's available everywhere you get books. So if you go into a local bookshop and ask them for it, I'd love that because it's uh, chances are they're not going to order just one. They'll order three for you to get in and support your local business. It was great. Last weekend I was in Vermont. I was in Stowe, Vermont. I stopped at a small bookstore and asked them about their books and there was my book on the bookshelf and I signed it and left it there. So wow. it was great to, it was uh, always an interesting feeling. So yeah, please do that. It's great. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, no, no, I, I was going to say, I think we will, uh, first off, we will um, be going around asking uh, all of our bookstores to uh, get one of your copies. But I think, uh, you know, we also do have a link in the, the comments of your book. So um, yeah, CJ, thank you so much. This has been, this has been incredible. Um, Last. You have a ton of information that is super valuable and it's been awesome to see you spread that. So yeah. Um, Thank you, everyone, and hope you have an awesome weekend. Uh, happy Friday, and uh, if you do celebrate, happy Easter as well. And uh, you'll hear from uh, us next week. Okay. Be, be nice to each other. Namaste. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everyone. Oh, okay. We just ended the live video. CJ, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. All right. Um, oh, let me end the broadcast.